happiness is found in doing, not merely in possessing. Chapter 7 Imagination The Workshop of the Mind The Fifth Step Toward Riches The imagination is literally the workshop where all plans are created. It is where the impulse, the desire, is given shape, form, and action through the aid of the imaginative faculty of the mind. It has been said that we can create anything that we can imagine. Through the aid of imagination, we have discovered and harnessed more of nature's forces during the past 50 years than during the entire history of the human race previous to that time. And even with all we have accomplished, we have come nowhere near the limit of what we are capable. Our only limitation, within reason, lies in the development and use of our imagination. The human imagination offers so much possibility, it is as though we have merely discovered that we have an imagination and have just started to use it in a very elementary way. Two Forms of Imagination The imaginative faculty functions in two forms. One is known as synthetic imagination and the other as creative imagination. Editor's Comments In modern usage, the word synthetic has taken on a negative connotation, implying that something is artificial, not the real thing. Today the word synthesized, which is defined as something made up from component parts, would better describe what Hill had in mind and has been substituted here accordingly. This is the end of the editor's comments. Synthesized Imagination through this faculty, you arrange old concepts, ideas, or plans into new combinations. Synthesized imagination does not create anything. It merely works with the material of experience, education, and observation with which it is fed. It is the faculty used by most inventors, with the exception of those geniuses who draw upon the creative imagination when they cannot solve problems through synthesized imagination. Creative Imagination through the faculty of creative imagination, the finite human mind has direct communication with infinite intelligence, the faculty through which hunches and inspirations are received. It is by this faculty that all basic or new ideas are handed over to mankind. It is through this faculty that we pick up vibes from other people, and in that way one individual may tune in or communicate with the subconscious minds of others. This concept is explained in greater detail later. The creative imagination works automatically, but only when your conscious mind is motivated, energized, and working at such a high rate that it becomes very perceptive and receptive, such as when the conscious mind is stimulated through the emotion of a strong desire. The great leaders of business, industry, and finance, and the great artists, musicians, poets, and writers became great because they develop the faculty of creative imagination. Editor's Comment At this point, it should be noted that both kinds of imagination are equally valuable to you, and they work together so seamlessly, it is often hard to tell where one ends and the other begins. For instance, when Jeff Bezos created the idea of Amazon.com, was it synthesized imagination or creative imagination? At the time, Many people were getting onto the idea of the Internet as a sales medium. From this, it could be concluded that he was drawing upon experience, education, and observation, which would mean he was using synthesized imagination. But why did he decide to sell books? Was that synthesized or creative? Did that idea come out of something in his subconscious that just felt like books were the right thing? And what about that name? Calling a bookstore Amazon didn't make sense to anyone but Bezos, but it certainly caught the public's attention. How important was the name in the store's success? Was that choice creative or synthesized? Now take it a step further. What about eBay? Amazon had already shown that you could sell a lot of goods on the Internet. When Pierre Omidyar hit on the idea of selling things on the Internet by turning it into an auction house, what part was synthesized and what part was creative? The answer is, it doesn't matter. Whether you are consciously assembling the parts of a plan or if subconsciously the pieces fall into place and suddenly hit you in a flash of inspiration, all that matters is that you are putting your imagination to work. And the more you use it, 
the better both the synthesized and the creative will work for you. This is the end of the editor's comment. Desire is a thought, an impulse. It is nebulous and ephemeral. It is abstract and of no value until it has been transformed into its physical counterpart. While the synthesized imagination is the one that will be used most frequently in the process of transforming desire into money, there will be circumstances and situations that demand the use of the creative imagination as well. Both the synthesized and the creative imagination become more alert and receptive with use. And though your imaginative faculty may have become weak through lack of use, you can revive it. Just as any muscle or organ of the body develops the more it is used, your imagination also becomes more receptive in direct response to the amount that you use it. Use your synthesized imagination. First, let us focus attention on the development of the synthesized imagination. This is the faculty that you will use more often in converting desire into money. Transformation of the intangible impulse of desire into the tangible reality of money calls for the use of a plan or plans. To make plans, you must use your imagination. Mainly, this will require you to use your synthesized imagination as you draw upon your experience, your education, and your observations. Editor's Comment The following is adapted from Hill's later writing and appears in Napoleon Hill's Keys to Success. An excellent example of synthesized imagination is Edison's invention of the light bulb. He began with one recognized fact that other people had discovered. A wire could be heated by electricity until it produced light. The problem was that the intense heat quickly burned the wire out and the light never lasted more than a few minutes. Edison failed more than 10,000 times in his attempt to control this heat. When he found the method, it was by applying another common fact that had simply eluded everyone else. He realized that charcoal is produced by setting wood on fire, covering it with soil, and allowing the fires to smolder. The soil permits only enough air to reach the fire to keep it burning without blazing, and that way the wood isn't burned up. When Edison recognized this fact, his imagination immediately associated it with the idea of heating the wire. He placed the wire inside a bottle, pumped out most of the air, and produced the first incandescent light. It burned for eight and a half hours. Everything that Edison used to make the electric light was widely known, but the way he synthesized the knowledge changed the world and made him a very wealthy man. W. Clement Stone called the process the R2A2 formula, recognize and relate, assimilate and apply. If you do that with everything you see, hear, think and experience, it will give you a new way of looking at familiar things. If you do that, you can achieve what others believe is impossible. Later in this chapter, you will read of other fortunes that grew from even simpler synthesized ideas, and these stories should lead you to conclude that the combination of ideas is nothing that you couldn't have thought of yourself. That alone should start your own imagination synthesizing ideas. However, even though these stories will inspire you, and you will be anxious to get started, this is not yet the point for you to start making plans. Here, and throughout Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill reminds the reader that this book is meant to be read all the way through before beginning to put the philosophy into practice. There are other ideas to be assimilated from later chapters that will influence your imagination and therefore affect the plans you may develop. This is the end of the editor's comments. Read the entire book through, then come back to this chapter and begin to put your imagination to work on the building of a plan for transforming your desire into money. Examples and instructions for creating plans are given in almost every chapter. Carry out the instructions that are best suited to your needs and put your plan in writing. The moment you complete this, you will have definitely given concrete form to your intangible desire. Now, read that sentence once more in a slightly different way. The moment I put my plan in writing, I will have definitely given concrete form to my desire. Now read it aloud and realize what you are telling yourself. Desire 
is only a thought. Through synthesized imagination, your experience, education, and observations will give it shape, form, and action. From the moment you follow those instructions and write out your desire and your plan, you will have actually taken the first of a series of steps that will enable you to convert the thought into its physical counterpart. Editor's Comments Synthesized imagination plays a role in every phase of a business plan. In fact, some of the most successful companies actually get started from synthesized imagination. When an entrepreneur, drawing upon his or her education, experience, and observations, takes an idea from one source and gives it a new application. That is exactly what happened with Ruth Handler. She and her husband, along with another partner, had started a small manufacturing company which had evolved into toy manufacturing. The success of their business depended on coming up with new toy ideas. Watching her young daughter at play, Ruth Handler noticed that she was fascinated with cutout books that featured teenage girl or career women paper dolls that she could cut out clothes for. She also knew that little girls loved to play dress-up in grown-up clothes. These ideas, drawn from Ruth Handler's education, experience, and observations, synthesized themselves in her imagination and came together as a new idea. Ruth Handler announced that they should make a lifelike teenage girl doll. Not a paper doll, but a real three-dimensional grown-up doll with a woman's figure, and they could also make grown-up clothes to fit it so that girls could play dress-up with the doll. In honor of the source of inspiration, Ruth Handler named the new doll after her daughter, Barbie. As obvious as it seems now, until Ruth Handler, no one had the imagination to make and market a doll that looked like a woman, and certainly no one had ever made endless collections of tiny women's fashions for a doll to wear. Previously, we mentioned Jeff Bezos creating Amazon by combining the idea of a bookstore with the Internet, and Pierre Omidyar doing the same thing with auctions when he launched eBay. Mary Kay Ash took the idea of women running their own businesses and added the idea of door-to-door -door sales. Anita Roddick took the trend of all-natural ingredients, combined it with cosmetics, and created the body shop empire. Bernard Marcus and Arthur Blank took the concept of the supermarket, combined it with hardware, and created Home Depot. Thomas Stenberg and Leo Kahn did the same thing with office supplies and launched Staples. Once the connections are made, it may seem obvious, but making these supposedly obvious connections has brought success to many people. Napoleon Hill says imagination is like a muscle that can be strengthened through use. Just as there are specific exercises that will build and improve physical muscles, specific exercises have been developed to improve and build imagination. And it is commonly accepted that creativity developed in one area will affect your creativity in others. Dr. Edward de Bono, one of the most highly regarded experts in the field, has written more than 25 books, including the bestsellers Lateral Thinking and Six Thinking Hats, that are literally designed to make you think. Dr. Betty Edwards' bestseller, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, uses drawing techniques to awaken creativity. Dr. Gabrielle Rico's bestseller, Writing the Natural Way, uses a technique called clustering as a way to break writer's block. And Tony Buzan uses a similar method for opening your mind that he terms mind mapping. In their bestseller, Super Learning, Sheila Ostrander and Lynn Schroeder show ways to use classical music. And Roger Von Eck suggests puzzles and riddles as stimuli in A Whack on the Side of the Head. This is the end of the editor's comments. Tapping into Creative Imagination the earth on which you live, you yourself, and every other material thing are the result of evolutionary change, through which bits of matter have been organized and arranged in an orderly fashion. As far as science has been able to determine, the entire universe consists of but two things, matter and energy. Moreover, and this statement is of stupendous importance, this earth, every one of the billions of individual cells of your body, and every subatomic particle of matter began as an intangible form of energy. Through the combination of energy and matter has been created everything perceptible, from the largest star in the heavens 
down to and including man himself. Desire is a thought impulse. Thought impulses are forms of energy. When you begin the process of acquiring money by using the thought impulse of desire, you are drafting into your service the same stuff that nature used in creating this earth, as well as every material form in the universe, including your body and your brain, in which the thought impulses function. Editor's Comments Although recent developments in physics, gauge theory, string theory, membrane theory, and others, have advanced our understanding of matter and energy, Hill's preceding description remains in accord with modern science. The newer theories are variations on and refinements of the basic concept that everything in the universe is either space, time, matter, or energy. And as Einstein stated, energy and matter are in fact different forms of the same thing. As Hill says, everything from the stars to the solar system to the earth to you, your brain, and that little spark called a thought, are all the same stuff. As when a tablecloth is spread out, there are folds and bumps in the fabric that are all different from each other, but they are all still tablecloth. Like the folds and bumps in the tablecloth, energy and matter are the same thing in different forms. Therefore you, matter, your thoughts, energy, and everybody else, matter, and their thoughts, energy, and all other things, matter, are not just interconnected, but are in essence all the same thing. Hill calls this interrelation of everything to everything else infinite intelligence. In the chapter on faith, he made his first mention of infinite intelligence being the source of hunches, intuition, and flashes of inspiration. In the chapter on autosuggestion, he proposed that the subconscious mind is the connection with infinite intelligence. In this chapter, Hill elaborates that creative imagination is the receiver through which these flashes of insight come to us from infinite intelligence. Under some circumstances, when your mind is operating at a high rate, your creative intelligence receives not just an idea, but also a flash of intuition. You get a hunch or a premonition about something or somebody. That flash could not come from your conscious or your subconscious because neither ever had the information. Because everything is a part of everything else, your creative imagination, energy, pulled the thought, energy, directly from the common pool of infinite intelligence, energy, that contains not just your subconscious, energy, but all other subconscious minds, energy, as well. Infinite intelligence is a complex concept, and for those readers who find themselves questioning the process, be assured that Hill expands on the theory in later chapters. The editors advise the reader to set aside any questions for the moment and focus on the logical and practical application Hill had in mind. This is the end of the editor's comments. You are engaged in trying to turn your desire into its physical or monetary counterpart. And there are laws of physics and principles of psychology that can help you. But first, you must give yourself time to become familiar with these laws and learn to use them. Through repetition and by describing these principles from every conceivable angle, I hope to reveal to you the secret through which every great fortune has been accumulated. Strange and paradoxical as it may seem, the secret is not a secret. It is made obvious in the earth the stars, the planets, in the elements above and around us, in every blade of grass, and every form of life within our vision. Do not be discouraged if you do not fully understand or accept this theory. I do not expect that you will accept all that is in this chapter on your first reading. Assimilate as much as you can now as you read this for the first time. Later, when you reread and study it, you will discover that something has happened to clarify it, and give you a broader understanding of the whole. Above all, do not stop nor hesitate in your study of these principles until you have read the book at least three times. Then you will not want to stop. How to Make Practical Use of Imagination Ideas are the beginning points of all fortunes. Ideas are products of the imagination. 
following are two true stories about ideas that have yielded huge fortunes. I hope that these stories will convey how important a role imagination can play in turning an idea into success, and that they will illustrate the method by which imagination may be used in accumulating riches. The Enchanted Kettle In the late 1880s, an old country doctor drove to town, hitched his horse, quietly slipped into a drugstore by the back door, and began dickering with a young drug clerk. For more than an hour behind the prescription counter, the old doctor and the clerk talked in low tones. Then the doctor left. He went out to the buggy and brought back a large, old-fashioned kettle, a big wooden paddle, used for stirring the contents of the kettle, and deposited them in the back of the store. The clerk inspected the kettle, reached into his inside pocket, took out a roll of bills, and handed it over to the doctor. The roll contained exactly $500, the clerk's entire savings. The doctor handed over a small slip of paper on which was written a secret formula. The words on that small slip of paper were worth a king's ransom, but not to the doctor. Those magic words were needed to start the kettle to boiling, but neither the doctor nor the young clerk knew what fabulous fortunes were destined to flow from that kettle. The old doctor was glad to sell the outfit for $500. The clerk was taking a big chance by staking his entire life savings on a mere scrap of paper and an old kettle. He never dreamed his investment would start a kettle to overflowing with gold that would one day surpass the miraculous performance of Aladdin's lamp. What the clerk really purchased was an idea. The old kettle and the wooden paddle and the secret message on a slip of paper were incidental. The miracle of that kettle only began to take place after the new owner mixed with the secret instructions, an ingredient of which the doctor knew nothing. See if you can discover what it was that the young man added to the secret message, which caused the kettle to overflow with gold. Here you have a story of facts stranger than fiction, facts that began in the form of an idea. Just look at the vast fortunes of gold this idea has produced. It has paid, and still pays, huge fortunes to men and women all over the world who distribute the contents of the kettle to millions of people. The old kettle is now one of the world's largest consumers of sugar, thus providing jobs to thousands of men and women engaged in growing sugar cane and in refining and marketing sugar. The old kettle consumes annually millions of bottles and cans, providing jobs to huge numbers of workers. The old kettle gives employment to an army of clerks, stenographers, copywriters, and advertising experts throughout the nation. It has brought fame and fortune to scores of artists who have created magnificent pictures describing the product. The old kettle has converted Atlanta, which was a small southern city, into the business capital of the South, where it now benefits, directly or indirectly, every business and practically every resident of the city. The influence of this idea now benefits every civilized country in the world, pouring out a continuous stream of gold to all who touch it. Gold from the kettle built and maintains one of the most prominent colleges of the South, where thousands of young people receive the training essential for success. If the product of that old brass kettle could talk, it would tell thrilling tales in every language, tales of love, of business, of professional men and women who are daily being stimulated by it. I am sure of at least one such tale of romance, for I was a part of it, and it all began not far from the very spot on which the drug clerk purchased the old kettle. It was there that I met my wife, and it was she who first told me of the enchanted kettle. It was the product of that kettle we were drinking when I asked her to accept me for better or worse. Whoever you are, wherever you may live, whatever your occupation, just remember every time you see the words Coca-Cola that its vast empire of wealth and influence grew out of a single idea. And that idea, the mysterious ingredient the drug clerk, Asa Candler, mixed with a secret formula was imagination. Stop and think of that for a moment. Keep in mind that the steps to riches described in this book are the very same principles through which the influence of Coca-Cola has been extended to every city, town, village, and crossroads of the world. Now here's the most important thing to remember. The ideas you create 
may have the possibility of duplicating the enormous success of this worldwide thirst killer. Editor's Comments Harlan Sanders, too, had a recipe in a magic kettle. Actually, his kettle was a pressure cooker, but neither his cooker nor his recipe of eleven herbs and spices would be mentioned here if he didn't also have imagination. Harlan Sanders owned and operated a successful motel and cafe in Corbin, Kentucky. Then, when the new interstate highway came through, it bypassed Sanders' location. In a short time, his business went broke, leaving him with little more than his recipe for fried chicken and a way to make it quickly in a pressure cooker. At 62 years of age, the colonel, as people called him, had to find a new way to make a living. That's when the magic ingredient, imagination, came in. He decided he wasn't going to sell fried chicken anymore. Instead, he would sell his method for making it. He packed his recipe and cooker into the back of his car and hit the road to demonstrate his fried chicken to other restaurant owners. In the first two years, he managed to sell five franchises. Two years later, he'd sold 200. Four years later, he was up to 600 locations when he was approached by an investment group to sell his company. Recognizing that the magic wasn't just in the kettle or the recipe, the new owners asked Colonel Sanders to stay on as spokesman for the company, which he did until his death in 1980. Today, there are almost 12,000 KFC locations in more than 80 countries with sales of nearly $10 billion a year. Debbie Fields was a 20-year-old housewife who loved to bake cookies. She had no formal education and no business experience, but she had a recipe and an imaginative idea that people would like to buy fresh, hot, soft cookies from a walk-up store. The business people and bankers she approached told her she was crazy, but she and her husband continued to pitch her idea to banker after banker until they finally wore one down enough to give Debbie Fields a loan to open a store in Palo Alto, California. By noon on her first day, she still hadn't sold a cookie, so she went out into the street and gave away samples. That did it. Her walk-in try-a-sample cookie store took off. Today, Mrs. Field's stores are all across America. Harvard Business School uses her methods as a case study in efficiency, and Debbie Fields has become a best-selling author, an in-demand motivational speaker, and a television personality. Wally Famous Amos was a Los Angeles talent agent who copied a cookie recipe off the back of a bag of Nestle's chocolate chips. He made a few changes to personalize the recipe and started to give out his version of homemade cookies as a sort of calling card. His clients and business associates liked them so much that Wally finally decided to quit show business and open a store. He did it with a Hollywood agent's flair. He opened on Sunset Boulevard with 2,000 invitations, a red carpet, and celebrities. With the same flair, he put his picture on the bag, filled the bags with cookies, and started selling them to exclusive department stores and specialty shops. Ten years later, Famous Amos Cookies were a $10 million business. Ray Kroc was over 50 and selling milkshake mixers when he heard about a hamburger stand in California, owned by Dick and Mac McDonald, that was doing great business. He packed his car and headed to San Bernardino to check it out. What he saw was a sit-down restaurant that had a limited menu featuring a good hamburger recipe, and they were serving them faster than any place he'd ever seen. Figuring that if there were more places like this, he could sell them a lot of milkshake mixers, Kroc pitched the McDonald brothers on the idea of opening some more McDonald's. They were interested, but they didn't know who they could get to open the new restaurants. This time, it was a recipe and a magic griddle, but it still needed the extra ingredient imagination. On the spot, Ray Kroc offered to go into business with them and open the restaurants himself. According to the signs on the Golden Arches, Ray Kroc's imagination paid off in billions of hamburgers sold. In 1982, Howard Schultz went to work as the director of marketing for a small coffee importer wholesaler called Starbucks, which had only one location in Seattle's Pike Place Market. While he was on a trip to Italy, Schultz got the idea that the coffee bar culture he saw in Milan could be transposed to the downtown Seattle scene. He convinced the company to try it. His coffeehouse idea was such a success that Schultz went out and raised the money to buy the company. 
Five years after he'd joined Starbucks, he was CEO of a company that had 17 locations. Fifteen years later, Schultz's coffeehouse culture was on every corner of America, and there were more than 7,000 Starbucks worldwide. As a final example of imagination, we offer Paul Newman's salad dressing. Now, it would seem that it doesn't take much imagination for a big celebrity to put his name on a product, and that's what Newman thought, too. But when he and his partner, A. E. Hotchner, pitched their salad dressing idea to companies that specialize in marketing foods, nobody was interested unless they would personally put up about $1 million for the first year's operations. According to Newman and Hotchner's book, Shameless Exploitation, they found out that almost all celebrity products in the food business have been disastrous failures, and now nobody would touch them. So when it came to marketing salad dressing, even Paul Newman's big name wasn't the magic they needed. And unless they were willing to put up a ridiculous amount, money wasn't the magic either. The magic would have to be in the imaginative way that they would convince the right people to help them, and in having the perseverance to stick with it until they succeeded. And just like most everyone with an idea, they were told they were crazy to try it. They were turned down by bottling companies that wouldn't do small runs, and they were rejected by distributors who wouldn't take a chance on another celebrity product. In the end, it was one supermarket owner, Stu Leonard, who helped hook them up with the right suppliers. But even that wouldn't have been enough if Stu Leonard hadn't had enough imagination to see the possibilities and agree to put Newman's own salad dressing on the shelves in his store. Fifteen years later, Newman's own brands was a $100 million company which gives all profits to charity. This is the end of the editor's comments. What I would do if I had a million dollars. The following story proves the truth of that old saying, where there's a will, there's a way. It was told to me by that beloved educator and clergyman, Frank W. Gonzalez, who began his preaching career in the stockyards region of Chicago. While Dr. Gonzalez was going through college, he observed many defects in our educational system, defects that he believed he could correct if he were the head of a college. He made up his mind to organize a new college in which he could carry out his ideas without being handicapped by orthodox methods of education. He needed a million dollars to put the project across. Where was he to lay his hands on so large a sum of money? That was the question that absorbed most of this ambitious young preacher's thought, but he couldn't seem to make any progress. Every night, he took that thought to bed with him. He got up with it in the morning. He took it with him everywhere he went. He turned it over and over in his mind until it became a consuming obsession with him. Being a philosopher as well as a preacher, Dr. Gonzalez recognized, as do all who succeed in life, that definiteness of purpose is the starting point from which one must begin. He recognized, too, that definiteness of purpose takes on life and power when backed by a burning desire to translate that purpose into its material equivalent. He knew all these great truths, yet he did not know where or how to lay his hands on a million dollars. The normal thing would have been to give up and quit, saying, Ah, oh, well, my idea is a good one, but I can't do anything with it because I can't raise the million dollars. That is exactly what the majority of people would have said, but it is not what Dr. Gonzalez said. What he said, and what he did, are so important that I will now introduce him and let him speak for himself. One Saturday afternoon, I sat in my room thinking of ways and means of raising the money to carry out my plans. For nearly two years I had been thinking, but I had done nothing but think. The time had come for action. I made up my mind, then and there, that I would get the necessary million dollars within a week. How? I was not concerned about that. The main thing of importance was the decision to get the money within a specified time. I want to tell you that the moment I reached a definite decision to get the money within a specified time, a strange feeling of assurance came over me such as I had never before experienced. Something inside me seemed to say, why didn't you reach that decision a long time ago? The money was waiting for you all the time. I called the newspapers and announced I would preach a sermon the following morning entitled, What I Would Do If I Had a Million Dollars. I went to work on the sermon immediately, but I must tell you frankly that the task was not difficult because I had been preparing that sermon for almost two years. 
Long before midnight, I had finished writing the sermon. I went to bed and slept with a feeling of confidence, for I could see myself already in possession of the million dollars. Next morning, I arose early, went into the bathroom, read the sermon, then knelt on my knees and asked that my sermon might come to the attention of someone who would supply the needed money. While I was praying, I again had that feeling of assurance that the money would be forthcoming. In my excitement, I walked out without my sermon and did not discover the oversight until I was in my pulpit and about ready to begin delivering it. It was too late to go back for my notes, and what a blessing that I couldn't go back. Instead, my own subconscious mind yielded the material I needed. When I arose to begin my sermon, I closed my eyes and spoke with all my heart and soul of my dreams. I not only talked to my audience, but I fancy I talked also to God. I told what I would do with a million dollars if that amount were placed in my hands. I described the plan I had in mind for organizing a great educational institution, where young people would learn to do practical things and at the same time develop their minds. When I had finished and sat down, a man slowly arose from his seat, about three rows from the rear, and made his way toward the pulpit. I wondered what he was going to do. He came into the pulpit, extended his hand, and said, Reverend, I liked your sermon. I believe you can do everything you said you would if you had a million dollars. To prove that I believe in you and your sermon, if you will come to my office tomorrow morning, I will give you the million dollars. My name is Philip D. Armour. Young Gonzales went to Mr. Armour's office, and the million dollars was presented to him. With that money, he founded the Armour Institute of Technology, now known as Illinois Institute of Technology. The million dollars that launched the Armour Institute came as the result of an idea. Behind the idea was a desire that young Gonzales had been nursing in his mind for almost two years. Observe this important fact. He got the money within 36 hours after he reached a definite decision in his own mind to get it and decided upon a definite plan for getting it. There was nothing new or unique about young Gonzales vaguely thinking about a million dollars and weakly hoping for it. Others have had similar thoughts. But there was something very unique and different about the decision he reached on that memorable Saturday, when he put vagueness into the background and definitely said, I will get that money within a week. The principle through which Dr. Gonzales got his million dollars is still alive. It is available to you. This universal law is as workable today as it was when the young preacher made use of it so successfully. Editor's Comments The Armour Institute of Technology opened in 1893, offering courses in engineering, chemistry, architecture, and library science and in 1940 became the Illinois Institute of Technology when the Armour Institute merged with the Lewis Institute, a Chicago college that had opened in 1895 and offered liberal arts as well as science and engineering courses. In 1949, the Institute of Design, founded in 1937, also merged with IIT, followed in 1969 by the Chicago-Kent College of Law and the Stewart School of Business and in 1986 by the Midwest College of Engineering. Today there are several campuses in downtown Chicago. IIT has been called the alma mater of accomplishments. This is the end of the editor's comment. How to Transmute Ideas into Cash Asa Candler and Dr. Frank Gonzalez had one characteristic in common. Both knew the astounding truth that ideas can be transmuted into cash through the power of definite purpose plus definite plans. If you are one of those who believe that hard work and honesty alone will bring riches, you can forget it. It is not true. Riches, when they come in huge quantities, are never the result of hard work alone. Riches come, if they come at all, in response to definite demands based upon the application of definite principles and not by chance or luck. Generally speaking, an idea is a thought that prompts you to action because it appeals to your imagination. All master salespeople know that ideas can be sold where merchandise cannot. Ordinary salespeople do not know this. That is why they are ordinary. 
a publisher of low-priced books made a discovery that has been worth much to publishers. He learned that many people buy titles and not the contents of books. By merely changing the name of one book that was not moving, his sales of that book jumped upward more than a million copies. The inside of the book was not changed in any way. He merely ripped off the cover and put on a new cover with a title that had box office appeal. That, as simple as it may seem, was an idea. It was imagination. Editor's Comment For those readers who think that replacing the cover of a book is just too simple, or that they couldn't do it anyway because they are not book publishers, the editors would point out that if you had had that simple idea before the publisher did, he probably would have been glad to sell you those failed books at pennies on the dollar. Then you could have been the one to change the cover, and suddenly you would have been the publisher of a bestseller. However, the idea of replacing the covers wouldn't have meant a thing if you didn't also have ideas about how to market and promote that flashy new cover. And that is Hill's point. Coca-Cola was a recipe, a creative idea. But it would have stayed just a recipe if Asa Candler hadn't also had other creative ideas to market it and the faith in himself to carry through on those ideas. Spence Silver was a chemist working for 3M when, by accident, he created a glue that wasn't very sticky. Needless to say, 3M was not much interested in glue that didn't stick, and Silver's invention was shelved as a failure. But Silver liked his glue, so for five years he kept demonstrating it to anyone who would listen. Nobody did, until Arthur Fry, who worked in the tape division at 3M, found that when he was at choir practice, he kept losing his place in the hymnal because the pieces of paper he used to mark his place slipped down or fell out of the book. A little of Silver's not very sticky glue on the slips of paper, and they stayed where he wanted them, then peeled off easily when he was done. That was the Eureka moment. They had just invented the world's best bookmark, post-its. But that's not the end of the story, or the end of the imaginative ideas that were needed to make post-its happen. Fry would also need perseverance. First, he had to convince the engineers to solve production problems, and to do it, he knocked a hole in his basement wall so he could install a prototype of the production equipment. He stuck with it, and finally, two years later, 3M gave the project to their marketing department. The marketing experts put together ads and brochures selling this sticky notepad idea and rolled it out in a four-city test. The results were a disaster. Nobody got it, so nobody bought it. Who would pay money for scratch paper? The Post-it project was about to be scrapped when Jeffrey Nicholson and Joseph Ramey added their imaginations. Like Silver and Fry, Nicholson and Ramey had faith in the idea because they saw how people in their office fell in love with these little sticky pieces of paper once they started working with them. So Nicholson and Ramey went to Richmond, Virginia, one of the four test cities that had failed, and they went up and down the business district, going into offices and giving pads of post-its to receptionists, secretaries, and anyone else who would listen. Whereas 3M's conventional marketing machinery had failed, giving post-its to the people who would actually use them did the trick. Once those Richmond office workers started to use post-its, it didn't seem like a bad idea at all to pay for scratch paper. They got it, and they bought it. The Richmond test turned from failure to success, and soon post-its were sticking to everything around the world. Here's another simple idea that imagination turned into success. The story began with a man whose problem was just the opposite of Spence Silver's. This man had something that stuck too well. George de Mestrel was a Swiss mountaineer who went hunting one day with his dog. But when they got home, they were both covered with burrs. The burrs were so difficult to remove that de Mestrel put them under a magnifying glass to learn why he saw that they were covered with tiny hooks which attached themselves to fur and fabric. That was when the flash hit. If burrs stuck where you didn't want them, why couldn't you put tiny hooks on things so they would stick where you did want them? Like everyone else mentioned in this book, Demestral had an imaginative idea. But that was just the beginning. He also had the faith in himself to keep going when people laughed at his idea, which many did until he eventually found a French textile plant that would help him do what he wanted. 
However, even when they finally worked out a way to use cotton fabric to make what they called locking tape, they couldn't afford to mass produce it. And that's when Demestral accidentally discovered that when you sew nylon under infrared light, it naturally made little hooks. Now they could manufacture it economically. All they needed was a name. One side was fuzzy like velvet, and the other side was crochet, the French word for hook. Take half vel and half crow, combine it with imagination. The result is velcro, and a Swiss mountaineer becomes a business tycoon. The Sony Corporation once tried to make a very small stereo tape recorder that would work with standard size cassettes, but they couldn't do it. They could make a small playback machine, but at the time the electronics needed to also make it a recording machine just couldn't be made small enough. They concluded that the design was a failure. Then one day Sony's honorary chairman, Masaru Ibuka, walked into the laboratory and saw that a few of the engineers were using the prototypes of the failed tape recorder to listen to music tapes. They didn't seem to care that it couldn't record. They just liked to be able to walk around listening to their favorite music. Then came the imaginative idea that made all the difference. Ibuka remembered that another division was working on lightweight headphones. That was the flash. Ibuka's imagination made the connection that the rest of the engineers had not. In Ibuka's view, they hadn't made a failed recorder. They had created a successful private stereo listener. They added the headphones, named it The Walkman, and it revolutionized both the music business and the electronics industry. Clarence Saunders was a grocery clerk in a small southern retail store. One day he was standing with a tray in his hands, waiting his turn in a cafeteria. He had never earned more than $20 a week before then, and no one had ever noticed anything about him that indicated unusual ability, but something took place in his mind as he stood in the line of waiting people that put his imagination to work. That was when he came up with the idea that this same self-serve concept would also work at the grocery store. Clarence Saunders took the idea to his boss. Naturally, his boss told him he was crazy. So Clarence Saunders quit his job, went out and did what he needed to do to raise the money, and opened the first self-serve grocery store. He called it Piggly Wiggly, and Clarence Saunders, the $20-a-week grocery clerk, rapidly became the multi-million dollar chain store grocery man of America. Sylvan Goldman was the owner of a number of Piggly Wiggly stores in Oklahoma, and like any good businessman, he spent a lot of time watching his customers go up and down the aisles, putting their choices into their baskets or net shopping bags. One night, while trying to figure out how to get his customers to buy more at one time, he found himself staring at a basket sitting on the seat of a wooden folding chair. Eureka! He called in his mechanic, Fred Young. They put some wheels on the bottom of the legs, added another basket below the seat, and the shopping cart was born. As this edition is being readied for publication, there are about 35 million shopping carts in America and approximately 1.25 million new carts are sold each year. Thomas Stenberg, whom we also mentioned earlier, was another supermarket executive who watched his customers as they shopped. By this time, shopping carts were well established in supermarkets, and it was because his customers were pushing shopping carts up and down the aisles that he got his flash of inspiration. He was so sure of his idea that he convinced another supermarket executive, Leo Kahn, to join him. Together, they took the supermarket concept and applied it to selling office supplies. And in 1986, they opened their first store in Brighton, Massachusetts. They called it Staples. In 1989, they took the company public. And 10 years later, there were more than 1,000 Staples stores with revenues exceeding $7 billion. We'll end this commentary with another set of connected stories, which make the point that sometimes the most imaginative part of marketing is in the timing. If you were to go shopping in the late 1800s, it usually meant bartering with a merchant who would then have to get the goods from storage shelves kept behind the counter. In the 1870s, fixed pricing was just starting to be used by storekeepers. Merchants were trying the idea by setting out a table of merchandise that was all priced the same, usually five cents. 
Frank Winfield Woolworth was a clerk in a general store, and he convinced the store owner to let him try the five-cent table idea. Although it worked, the owner wasn't impressed. So Woolworth borrowed $350 from his boss and in 1879 opened his first five-cent store in Utica, New York. It was an entire store full of goods where everything cost a nickel. A year later, he had four stores, and the fourth one, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, was the first that he named F.W. Woolworth's Five and Ten Cent Store. Twenty years later, he had 238 stores. By the time of his death in 1919, there were over 1,000 F.W. Woolworth locations. He had established the first nationwide chain of general merchandise stores, and he had built the tallest building in New York City as his headquarters. The Woolworth Company stayed true to the original idea and didn't carry any merchandise that cost more than a dime until 1932, when the top price was raised to 20 cents. But as times changed, the fixed price was dropped, the merchandise became more varied, and the company kept growing until it had over 8,000 stores worldwide, selling everything from notions to appliances and furniture. Then, in the 1960s and 1970s, something started to happen. The mood of America was changing, but the Woolworth stores weren't. And that was when Sam Walton opened the first Walmart in Rogers, Arkansas, in 1962. Walton got into the retail business after the Second World War, when his father-in-law loaned him the money to buy a franchise Butler Brothers store in Bentonville, Arkansas. By 1962, Sam and his brother Bud owned 16 variety stores in Arkansas, Missouri, and Kansas. It was in these stores that Sam Walton first started adding the magic ingredient of imagination. In addition to his flair for promotion, Sam tried new approaches to the way household goods and general merchandise could be sold at retail. He insisted on clean, well-lighted interiors, and he introduced the concept of self-service, with aisles wide enough for shopping carts and checkout counters at the front of the store. He also started buying direct from manufacturers, and he created profit-sharing plans that kept his family of employees loyal, hard-working, and neighborly. In 1962, he incorporated those and other imaginative ideas when he opened his first store that he called Walmart. The basic magic was that he sold brand-name merchandise at discount prices, but there was also magic in the way he kept a friendly hometown feel to his store, even though it was what is now called a big-box store. Sam Walton's Walmart store was a success, so he just kept building and opening more of them, first in small towns and rural areas, then in larger towns, then big cities, and it wasn't long before he had a national chain. By 1992, when Sam Walton died, there were more than 1,700 Walmart stores. It was the biggest retailer in the country, it employed more than 600,000 people, and Sam Walton was the richest man in America. In 2003, the stores numbered more than 3,200 in the U.S. and more than 1,100 in foreign countries. The company employed more than 1,300,000 people worldwide and served more than 1 million customers a week. Along the way, Woolworths and other older retailers such as Kresge's tried to get on the bandwagon with their Woolco and Kmart stores, but they couldn't seem to get it right. They had given up their old five-and-dime identity to become higher-priced general retailers. And when Walmart came along and redefined that part of the market, the others seemed to have run out of the kind of imagination they'd had in the beginning. Now, here's the twist to the story. David Gold was running a liquor store that he had inherited from his father. He noticed that whenever he put out a display of goods priced at 98 cents or one dollar, the goods would sell okay. But if his sign said 99 cents, the goods sold out in no time he decided that he would open a store called the 99-cent-only store where everything would be priced at 99 cents. Sound familiar? Frank Woolworth's imaginative idea from 1879, which had been dropped at his namesake chain by the 1940s and 1950s, had just gotten a fresh shot of imagination from David Gold in 1982. As usual, friends and family told him he was crazy, but David Gold went out to find suppliers who would sell him discontinued merchandise or overproduced products at a price low enough that he could offer them to the public at 99 cents. He found them. 
and they even had brand name products of everything from hardware to pantyhose, cleaning products, motor oil, kitchenware, cosmetics, electronics, toys, canned goods, frozen foods, cookies, fresh fruit, even gourmet foods. More than 5,000 items that he could sell for 99 cents and still make a profit. David Gold opened his first well-lighted, brightly colored green and fuchsia wide aisle store in Inglewood, California in 1982. By 2003, he had 142 stores in California, Nevada, and Arizona, and he was listed on the Forbes 400 as having earned a personal fortune estimated at more than $650 million. As Napoleon Hill wrote elsewhere about the creation of Piggly Wiggly, where in this story do you see the slightest indication of something that you could not duplicate? The plan, which made millions of dollars for its originator, was a very simple idea that anyone could have adopted, yet considerable imagination was required to put the idea to work in a practical sort of way. The more simple and easily adapted an idea is, the greater is its value. As no one is looking for ideas that are involved with great detail or are in any way complicated. This is the end of the editor's comments. There is no standard price on ideas. The creator of ideas sets his or her own price, and if they are smart, they get it. The story of practically every great fortune starts with a day when a creator of ideas and a seller of ideas got together and worked in harmony. Carnegie surrounded himself with men who could do what he could not do, men who created ideas and men who put ideas into operation, and that was what made him and the others fabulously rich. Millions of people go through life hoping for favorable breaks. Perhaps a favorable break can get you an opportunity, but the safest plan is not to depend upon luck. It was a favorable break that gave me the biggest opportunity of my life, but more than 20 years of determined effort had to be devoted to that opportunity before it became an asset. The break consisted of my good fortune in meeting and gaining the cooperation of Andrew Carnegie. On that occasion, Carnegie planted in my mind the idea of organizing the principles of achievement into a philosophy of success. Millions of people have profited by the discoveries made in the years of research, and fortunes have been accumulated through the application of the philosophy. The beginning was simple. It was an idea that anyone might have developed. The favorable break came through Carnegie. But what about the determination, definiteness of purpose, and the desire to attain the goal, and the persistent effort of all those years of research? It was no ordinary desire that survived disappointment, discouragement, temporary defeat, criticism, and the constant reminding that I was wasting my time. It was a burning desire an obsession. When the idea was first planted in my mind by Mr. Carnegie, it was coaxed, nursed, and enticed to remain alive. Gradually, the idea became a giant under its own power, and it coaxed, nursed, and drove me. Ideas are like that. First you give life and action and guidance to ideas. Then they take on a power of their own and sweep aside all opposition. Ideas are intangible forces but they have more power than the physical brains that give birth to them. They have the power to live on after the brain that creates them has returned to dust. <laughs>